Ignition sequence has started. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at 2.13. I'm a child of the Apollo era. I watched the moon landings in the early mornings you know, way back in 1969 as a teenager, and that really captured my imagination. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I was inspired by the dream of the 60s, really, which is we could go into space and explore new worlds, etc. Never thought I'd end up working in space, though. That's something you don't think about when you're a child. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scenes. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. The Surrey Space Center was born out of my interest in space and wanting to be part of the, you know, the whole sort of space activity. I started tracking some of the then Soviet and US spacecraft, trying to work out what they were doing, because of course the whole information wasn't public in those days. It turned out it was pretty easy to pick the satellites up using amateur radio equipment that we could buy quite cheaply. And so myself and my lab technician colleague Eric, we actually built a ground station and involved our students with it. After about five years, it just seemed that the next step was why not try and put something into space? Why not try and build a satellite? It could be built by a small team in a university, launched, work and do something useful. And I couldn't quite believe it when the, the rocket actually lit up and you could suddenly see it leaving the launch pad and it was carrying our microsatellite that we'd made into space. And all of a sudden, the world woke up to this and now small satellites are all the fashion. And so over the years, we've worked both as academics researching the technology and of course teaching this to uh, now several generations of students. At the Surrey Space Centre, we have a team of about 90 researchers who are working in many different aspects of space flight, from how the spacecraft move to the individual systems on board, particularly in the fields of remote sensing, communications, disaster monitoring. This research then feeds directly into our spin-out company, which then exploits that research and enables their customers to achieve an awful lot at really quite low cost compared to traditional space missions. We result in technology that greatly enhance the onboard capability of spacecraft with much reduced cost. This will help the UK to take leadership in developing low-cost space missions involving nanosatellites and macro rovers. From the beginning, we have shared our knowledge all the countries that previously couldn't justify large expenditure on space, now space becomes practical and affordable, and they can apply it to their own particular needs. And those relationships have, in many cases, have lasted decades. We continue to do more projects together and grow together. Start, two, one, boost with mission, and lift off. It's one thing to build and launch satellites, which give us a lot of excitement and a lot of satisfaction. But winning the Queen's Anniversary Prize was something a bit different because we were being recognised for a contribution at a national level, and that gave us the confidence to go even further. It's the sort of mark of quality that's been given to the university and to the Space Centre in particular, and that, with our overseas partners, gives them reassurance that what we're doing is nationally recognised. At the beginning, I would never dreamt that we would be where we are today. Roughly 600 people in SSTL building 20-some satellites, 100 people in the Space Centre looking over the horizon at new and exciting activities. And seeing the excitement on their faces and working with them is actually, I think, the thing that, that, that gives them the most satisfaction of all. SSTL has now become the world leader in small satellites. It's a great success story. They really do matter in a host of different ways.